Hi, and thanks for joining the Project Wingspan Plant Identification Webinar. I'm Elizabeth Kaufman, Plant Ecologist at Pollinator Partnership. We're really excited to welcome all of you who are new to the project to the Phase 2 expansion, as well as to welcome back those of you who are joining us again to learn the new plant additions and to review those who you're already familiar with. The Phase 2 expansion is helping to support the overarching goal of the project, which is to increase the quality, quantity, and connectivity of native pollinator habitat across the Midwest and Great Lakes region. Through the expansion, we have extended the program into Arkansas and Minnesota, while continuing to work in Wisconsin, Illinois, Michigan, Indiana, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. While we're not currently collecting seed in Missouri, we will continue to work with land managers and landowners through the Habitat Survey and to provide educational materials on habitat enhancement as well as state-specific opportunities that can help to provide additional resources. There are 34 native plant species that are included on our target plant list, including five species of milkweed, as illustrated here on the bloom chart. The species selected for inclusion had to meet multiple criteria and have all been vetted by plant science conservation authorities and by program partners. As I'm sure you're aware, due to the fact that we're working on a landscape scale effort, there are significant differences in latitude and corresponding environmental conditions. Therefore, species occurrences and distribution are varied across the program states. Because of this, not all the species shown here on this chart will be collected in every state. As I'm going through the descriptions for each of the species, you'll find the states that should be, as well as those that should not be, collecting that species written on the top right-hand side of the title bar. This information is also included in Appendix A of the training manual. We'll be discussing the species in order of the relative bloom time. Please note that specific bloom times will vary in between, in between the states as well as within the regional boundaries of each state. You can find more information on each species bloom time more specific for your home location through your local Native Plant Society and state natural heritage associations. I'll be referring to various standard botanical descriptive terms such as leaf shape, leaf arrangement, as well as floral arrangement. However, please don't worry if you're not already familiar with these terms. You can find and download reference charts within the Project Wingspan materials. It may also be helpful to pick up a state-specific floral reference field guide so that you also have references and comparisons to other floral you will encounter on the landscape. And as a reminder, you'll find in-depth plant descriptions, including key identifying characteristics, many, many more photos, and tips for distinguishing species that are similar to those that we're targeting in Appendix A, an in-depth guide to the target plant species profiles. We also have specific guidelines and protocols for harvesting each and every species on our target list. You'll find this within Section 12 of the Project Wingspan Seed Collection Manual. Please be sure to refer to these guidelines when making and shipping your collections. And now, let's meet the species. Zizia aura, or golden alexanders, is one of the first species to bloom on our target list. It occurs both in degraded and higher quality habitat areas. It grows to be approximately two and a half feet tall, forming occasional lateral stems. This, the leaves are compound and oddly pinnate with three or five leaflets. The flowers are flat to slightly rounded compound umbels of yellow flowers that occur at the end of the upper stems. Each compound umbel is about two to three inches across and consists of about 12 umbelettes. Collection begins in the late summer when the seeds ripen into capsules on the flower umbel. The capsules will turn from green to brown when they're ready to harvest. You want to remove the entire flower umbel or seed umbel and put that into your collection bag. Tritoscantia ohioensis, or Ohio spiderwort, can be found in a variety of habitat areas. It grows to be approximately two to four feet tall and remains mostly unbranched. Its gray or blue-green alternate leaves are up to 15 inches long and one, one inch across. They somewhat resemble grass blades. The light violet to blue violet flowers occur in small clusters on hairless flowering stems at the top of the plant. 
the best time to collect seed is in the midsummer. Seeds will ripen in capsules wrapped in the calyx. The, ca the capsules will open when the seed is ripe and the seeds will drop out quickly. It's best to start che checking for the seeds about six weeks after the flowers have bloomed to see if they're ready. These seeds are typically intolerant of dry storage, but for ease of handling, clean the seed and expedite the shipping to Mason State Nursery. Geranium maculatum, wild geranium, is a clump forming native woodland perennial, which typically occurs in woodland edges, thickets, and in shaded roadside areas. It forms a mound of foliage that grows to 24 inches tall and 18 inches wide. Its flowers are approximately one and a quarter inches in diameter, and pink to lilac, saucer shaped, and upward facing. Five petal flowers will, will emerge in the spring for a period of about six to seven weeks. It has palmately deeply cut five lobe leaves that grow up to six inches across. Its fruit are distinctive, beaked seed capsules, which give rise to the common name Cranesville. The collection time is early summer. These seeds can be challenging to collect as geranium seeds pods will burst when they're ripe and launch the seeds away from the parent plant. You'll need to collect these seeds before the seed is fully ripe when the carpal beak begins to turn yellow. Remove the umbel and put it in the collection bag closed tightly. Lupinus perennis, or wild lupin, is a larval host for the endangered Carner blue butterfly. It is also the host for many other butterflies and moth species. Its habitat is within prairies and woodlands in sandy soil, and it likes full to partial sun. It grows between eight inches and two and a half feet tall. Its stem is light green to reddish green. Its leaves are palmately divided into seven to 11 leaflets that sit on long petioles, approximately one to four inches long. Another common name for the species is sundial lupin because its palmate leaves orient themselves in the direction of the sun. Its flower is blue to indigo and less commonly white. It's five parted and about approximately one inch long. Its petals have a pea-like floral structure the floral arrangement is along a four inch to eight inch tall stalk. It's a densely clustered raceme. The bloom period generally only lasts about one month. The fruit is a hairy oblong flat pod, approximately 1.25 to two inches long, and it coils when open. The seed collection period is mid to late June. When the seeds are ripe, they can also be ejected several feet from the mother plant, so checking on maturation it frequently is recommended. Wild lupin can be confused with large leaf lupin, which is an introduced species. This plant can grow up to three and a half feet tall in comparison to wild lupin, which grows only to two and a half feet tall. The flower stalk on large leaf lupin grows to be eight inches to 24 inches in comparison to wild lupin that only grows from four to eight inches. And its leaves have 11 to 17 leaflets versus the native species that only has 7 to 11 leaflets. Penstemon digitalis or foxglove beard, beard tongue can be found in mesic black soil prairies, openings in upland and floodplain forests, woodland borders, thickets, savannas, and acid gravel steeps. The plant can grow to be up to three feet tall. The leaves are medium green, sometimes with reddish tints. They are variable in shape, but tend to be ovate or broadly lanceolate and are up to six inches long and two and a half inches wide. The opposite leaves on these stalks are more lanceolate in shape than, than the basal leaves. Their edges often have tiny teeth and the leaf surface is often shiny. The white flowers occur in an open panicle at the top of each flowering stem. They bloom during the late spring or early summer for about a month. Collection time is usually in the late summer and into the fall. The seeds will ripen in upright capsules that turn from green to brown when ready to harvest. Cut the capsules of the stem and place the entire capsules into your collection bag.
Okay, now we're going to move into our early summer blooming species. Cephalanthus occidentalis, or buttonbush, is the only woody shrub on our collection list. It's commonly found in and around ponds and the margins of streams and in other moist soil conditions. It commonly grows between three and eight feet tall, but occasionally can grow up to 20 feet tall. Its leaves are opposite, but sometimes occur in whorls of three. They grow up to six inches long and they're ovate to oblong with glossy upper surface. Its flowers form distinctive dense spher spherical clusters of approximately one inch to one and a half inch across. They have a fringe of crystals that protrude beyond the white corollas. These flowers are sweetly fragrant and you will most often find them above with multiple species of bees, butterflies, moths, wasps, beetles, and even occasional hummingbirds. Subsequent round masses, rounded masses of nutlets persist throughout the winter. The trunks of these shrubs are often twisted. The collection time for seed is between the late summer and early fall, before the nutlets start to fall apart. The seeds are ready for collection when they turn brown. You want to cut the entire nutlet off the stem and put that into your collection bag. As most of you know, milkweed species are the only plant species which serve as a host for the monarch butterfly reproduction. We're including five species of milkweed in our collection efforts for Project Wingspan in an effort to support increased monarch overposition or egg laying. These include common milkweed, swamp milkweed, world milkweed, butterfly milkweed, and poke milkweed. You'll find, you'll find Asclepias syriaca, or common milkweed, as the name implies, growing in many different environments. It likes disturbance, which is why it's associated with fields and roadsides. Individual plants have a single stem and most often will be found growing in clusters as it reproduces by root. The plants can grow up to six and a half feet tall. The leaf arrangement is opposite. The leaves are broadly ovate, to elliptical on short petioles and are about three to seven inches long. The flowers are round, humble clusters, and there are 20 to 30 small pink-white flowers per cluster. They bloom from June through August. The fruit are plump, tear-shaped pods that have a warty surface. These turn gray to, gold, to golden brown when they're ripe. Asclepias incarnata, or swamp milkweed, as its common name applies, prefers moist soils and can be found near bodies of water as well as in wet meadows and prairies. The plants can grow up to six feet tall with a single reddish stem growing from the base, but then branches into multiple stems toward the top of the plant. Its leaves are opposite and up to six inches long. They are narrow and lance-shaped, which distinguishes it from other milkweeds. Its flowers range from bright pink to magenta, red, and cream. They form, form open clusters at the top of the stems. They bloom July through September, and their fruit forms smooth, narrow, tear-shaped pods about four inches long and will turn brown when ripe. Asclepias tuberosa, or butterfly milkweed, occurs in drier and rockier prairies, as well as in fields and roadsides. It grows in clumps to a height of approximately one to three feet tall. Its stem is stout and densely hairy with leaves that are narrow and lance shaped. They're two to six inches long and may be arranged alternate or opposite. Its flowers are hard to miss with fantastic shades of bright orange that you don't see in many other species. Butterfly milkweed is a favorite of many bumblebees and is most often a buzz. Its flowers form flat top clusters of two to three inches across. Flowering occurs earlier than other milkweeds and will begin in June and last through August. It is also the only milkweed on our target list that does not produce milky sap. The seed pods are spindle shaped and are about three to six inches long. Asclepias versalata, or world milkweed, can be found in prairies and in forest openings. It grows from a single, slent, a single, single stem 
from one to three feet tall. It's easily distinguished by its leaves, which are very narrow, approximately an eighth of an inch wide and linear in shape. The leaves are arranged in whorls around the stem. Small greenish white flowers occur in rounded clusters of one to three inches across, appearing only on the upper part of the stem. The seed pods are thin and three to four inches long and be can, can be collected in mid to late September and early October. Asclepias exaltata, or polk milkweed, grows in woodland openings and in edges. It grows two to six feet tall and is usually unbranched. Its leaves are broadly ovate and may be slightly wavy along their edges. They grow about three to six inches long and up to three inches wide. Both the tips and the bottoms of the leaves taper to a point, and they sit, up, they sit along long petioles. They are arranged opposite along the stem. The flowers are bicolored with green or pale purple petals and hoods that are white or light pink. They form very loose, open umbels that measure from two to four inches across. Their fruit are also spindle-shaped, and they're four to six inches long and covered in downy hairs. Spreading dogbane can be confused with milkweed because of, the, because of its white milky sap. However, this plant is easily distinguishable from milkweed. It grows from two to five feet tall and is widely branching. Its flowers are simple bell-shaped form and they're in, co in contrast to milkweed's complex flowers. And the seed pods look like very thin van vanilla beans that hang downward versus milkweeds that grow upwards. For wet milkweed species, the collection times range from late summer into the fall. You don't want to harvest the pods before they are mature, and they will go from a soft green to a gold yellow or gray brown when ripe. You want to periodically check the progress of the pods to accurately plan your collection events. You can collect seed pods as they turn yellow or grayish brown and begin to split open, at which point the white fluff will be visible. The seeds should be brown and plump. You can open the pods and remove the fluff in the field if the wind is calm, otherwise it may be easier at home. You want to avoid collecting pods with visible holes as those seeds are most likely not viable due to insect damage. Although it may seem obvious, we want to avoid collecting pods that are infested by milkweed beetles or other insects as it can damage the seed making it non-viable. Milkweed be beetles in particular will not eat their way into the pods, but we'll wait for the pods to open. Chemicrista fasciculata, or partridge pea, is an annual flower in the legume family that typically grows one to three feet tall. These plants boost large, showy yellow flowers up to one inch across and bloom from the upper leaf axils in short clusters. Each of these has approximately two to six inch, two to six flowers. They flower from June into September. Each flower has five rounded petals and 10 stamen, six red and four yellow. The flowers are produced in an alternate pattern along the stems. The leaves are pinnately compound. Each leaf has eight to 18 pairs of small, narrow oblong leaflets. The leaves are also sensitive to daylight, which you can observe as they fold their leaflets in the late afternoon as darkness approaches. Their fruit form as narrow, flattened, dehiscent seed pods that are approximately two and a half inches long. Collection time is typically in the fall. The seeds ripen in the pod, which turn from green to brown when they're ready for harvest. You'll want to split open some of the pods in the field to see if the seeds are brown and plump. If they're still green, they're not ready. This is one of the few species on our list where the natural distribution mechanism will cause the seeds to be launched as the pods split open. It's recommended that you periodically check on the plants so you can time your collection appropriately. Onothero biensis is a biennial, growing as a basal rosette the first year and then bolting to flower in year two. The plants grow from two feet to seven feet tall. The leaves are lanceolate, up to eight inches long, 
and two inches wide. And they're colored olive to light green. It has a stout central stem, which sometimes may be branching. It's colored light green or red and has white hairs. Common evening primrose has a panicle of light yellow flowers at the top of the plant or at the end of major stems if the plant is bushy. Its flowers are one to two inches across with four heart-shaped petals. The flowers open from early evening to early morning, excuse me, from evening to early morning. Anothera species have a unique cross-shaped stigma in the center within their stamen. The fruit are narrow capsules, three quarters to one and a half inches long with rounded edges. Seed collection is between mid-August to mid-October. You may encounter other Onothera species on the landscape. However, common evening primrose can be distinguished from other Onothera species on the basis of its height, which most often exceeds three feet and can grow up to seven feet. The shape of its leaves, which resemble willow leaves growing up to eight inches long and two inches wide, and by the shape of its seed capsules, which have rounded edges rather than sharp or angular edges. So we're targeting two monuments in our collections. Picanthemum tenuifolium, or narrow leaf mountain mint, typically grows in the wild, in dry open, rocky woodlands, dry prairies, and in fields. It's an erect, many branched perennial that grows two to three feet tall and, fe and features extremely narrow, almost needle-like leaves. It produces profuse terminal clusters of small white flowers which bloom in the mid to late summer. All parts of the plant emit a strong mint-like aroma when crushed. Collection time is typically in the late summer. The seed heads will turn from green to brownish gray when they're ripe. You'll wanna cut off the entire seed head and put that into the collection bag to dry. Picanthemum virginiatum, or Virginia mountain mint, typically occurs in moist soils in wet meadows and along streams and ponds. It is an erect, many branch herbaceous perennial that grows two to three feet tall. Its leaves are lanceolate with smooth edges. It flo its flowers form in profuse, somewhat flat top terminal cl clusters made up of small, white, two lipped flowers, which bloom in the mid to late summer. All parts of this plant also will emit a strong mint like aroma when crushed. While the flowers are very similar to narrow leaf mountain mint, the leaves are wider, up to a half inch, and the stems have lines of white hairs along the square edges. The collection time is also in the late summer. The seed heads will turn from green to grayish brown when ripe. Again, you'll want to cut off the entire seed head and put that in your collection bag to dry. Heliopsis helianthoides, or oxide sunflower, is an upright, clump-forming, short-lived perennial. It typically grows three to four feet tall. Its flowers are two to three inches in diameter, with yellow-orange rays surrounding brownish-yellow center cones that bloom throughout the summer. Its leaves are ovate and toothed and up to six inches long. Key features for differentiating this from other similar-looking species are that both the ray and the disc flowers are fertile, and the flower heads are more erect. It can be confused with many other BYFs, or big yellow flowers, and it's best to key this one out in the field if you have any doubt. The seeds will ripen about a month after flowering, if the weather is mild. The seed will be ready for harvest when the heads turn from yellow to brown. This species is notorious for having a high number of sterile seeds, so it's recommended to perform a field test and split some open before collecting to check for viability. You'll want to place the entire flower head into your collection bag to dry. Retibida pinata, or yellow prairie coneflower, typically occurs in dry prairies. It grows from three to five feet tall. Its leaves towards the lower part of the plant are pinnately divided. They divide into three to seven lobes which sometimes can subdivide into secondary lobes and grow up to eight inches long. The leaves toward the top of the plant are smaller and lanceolate. Its flowers have 13 gracefully drooping, also known as reflexed, bright yellow ray flowers that are 
approximately three inches long. The ray flowers surround a dull gray to bronze central disc that looks like an elongated cylinder. If you crush the disc, it'll smell like anise. Collection time is typically late summer to early fall. When the cone becomes hard and turns grayish or dark brown, the seeds are ripe. You want to remove the entire cone from the plant and put that into your collection bag. Impatience capensis is found in moist to wet woodlands, meadows, along stream banks, and ravine bottoms. It is an annual that grows two to six feet tall. The leaves are alternate, ovate, and soft. They're bluish green and coarsely toothed and sit on top of long petioles. Its stem is smooth and branching and watery. They'll break very easily. Their flowers are orange and five parted, three quarters to one and a quarter inch long. They're tubular shaped resemb resembling cornucopias hanging from a slender pedicel. The fruit are pods that, which are slim and green when they're first forming. And as the seeds near maturation, the pod will become darker green brown and form a bulging center. Seed collection is July to October. Another name for impatience capensis is touch me not. The name comes from the seed pods that burst open when ripe and launch the seeds away from the parent plant. At maturity, even a slight touch is enough to burst the capsules and eject the seeds. So to gather, you want to carefully clasp your palm around the ripe pod and keep your hands closed to prevent losing the seeds. They open themselves if they're ripe. If the pods do not pop when touched, they are likely not ready to be gathered. The seeds should be dark green-brown in color once they're mature, and you'll usually find three to five in a pod. You may need to visit the same stand of plants a couple times to get a good representative of collection seeds. Rudbeckia hirta, or black-eyed Susan, is a common native wildflower, which typically occurs in prairies, in fields, open woodlands, and along roadsides. It is a coarse, hairy plant. The species name hirta means hairy in reference to the short bristles that cover the leaves and the stems. They typically grow one to two and a half feet tall. Each stem produces a single flower that are, is up to three inches across, with eight to 20 bright yellow to orange yellow rays. Its leaves are all alternate and feel rough due to its stiff hairs. Black-eyed Susans bloom throughout the summer months. The collection time is usually late summer through early fall. When the cone becomes hard and turns grayish or dark brown, the seeds are ripe. This usually will, will occur three to four weeks after the blooms fade. Again, you'll want to collect the entire seed head and put it in your collection bags to dry. Echinacea purpurea, or purple cone flower, is native to, to moist prairies, meadows, and open woodlands. It typically grows two to four feet tall with stems that have purple streaks. Its leaves are ovate to broadly lanceolate, and they have widely spaced teeth. Their flowers span two and a half to four inches. Collection time is late summer to early fall. The seed will be ready for harvest when the heads turn dark brown to black. These may feel prickly to your bare hands, so gloves are advised for harvesting. Monarda fistulosa, wild bergamot, or bee balm, occurs throughout moist, throughout moist to dryish soils in a variety of habitat areas. It typically grows two to five feet tall. As a member of the mint family, it tends to form large colonies. It has lavender, two-lipped, tubular flowers that appear in dense terminal heads on top of square stems. Its leaves are toothed and aromatic. The seeds will be ready to harvest when the flower heads turn from green to brown. The ripened seed is tiny and found inside the flower head. You want to remove any remaining petals and place the entire dried flower head in your collection bag. Verona castrum virginicum, or culver's root, occurs in moist meadows and prairies. It typically reaches 
three to six feet tall when in bloom. Its lance-shaped leaves are arranged in whorls around the stem with three to seven leaves per whorl. Dense, slender, eight-inch long spikes or racemes of teeny tube-like white to pale blue flowers open from the top down in the mid to late summer. Collection time is typically in the late summer. Its teeny seeds are produced inside small woody seed capsules. The capsules will turn from yellow to brown when they're ready for harvest. You want to remove the whole spike and put this into your collection bag to dry. Liatra spicata, commonly called marsh spike or dense blazing storm, is a tall, upright, clump forming perennial which is native to moist meadows. It typically grows two to five feet tall. Four inch to 18 inch long terminal flower spikes produce fluffy, small, but densely arranged deep purple flower heads. The flowers will begin to bloom at the top of the spike and open later below. The leaves are linear, which can be up to almost 10 inches long. They are alternate, but appear whorled around the stem. They bloom, in the, they bloom in the mid to late summer. Seed collection typically occurs around mid-September to early October. You can cut off the entire flower head once the seeds are dark and plump. You'll want to remove the fluff when you're home from the field and out of the wind. Liatra spera, commonly known as rough or button blazing star, is an upright clump forming perennial which typically grows two to five feet tall. It commonly occurs in dryer soils, on prairies, in glades, and in meadows. Stalks will grow from basal tufts, tufts of rough, very narrow, lance-shaped leaves. Its flowers are deep rose purple, each about one inch across, and are arranged along a long terminal flower spike. The flowers also begin to bloom at the top of the stalk and progress downward. This species is easily distinguished from other liatra species by the flowers, which resemble rounded or button-like, um, round or button-like uh, clusters without flaring bracts. It blooms a little bit later, late summer to fall, than most other Eliatra species. Seed collection typically occurs around mid-September to early October. The blazing stars on our target list can easily be distinguished from other blazing stars by their floral bracts. Liatra suspera has rounded bracts. The edges fold inward and are jagged. The bract color is green or tinged with purple. Liatra spicata has green to purple overlapping oval-shaped bracts that are pressed at the base of each flower head. The arrangement, si the arrangement size and bracts of these three other Liatra species outlined in the plant profiles make them easy to differ differentiate them from our two target species. Eupatorium profoliatum, or common bone set, typically occurs in wet, so wet soils in low woods, thickets, and in meadows and prairies. It grows two to four feet tall and tends to form colonies. It has white flat top cluster clusters of small flowers appearing in the late summer to fall. Its stems are covered in long hairs and its leaves are opposite, lamp-shaped and profoliate, meaning they unite around the stems almost appearing as one leaf. Common bone set can be distinguished from other bone set species by the profoliate leaves that surround the central stem. Tall bone set has opposite leaves that are sessile or have no leaf stem. And late bone set has distinct long petioles or leaf stems. All these species will have similar clusters of white flowers. Eutrochium purpureum or sweet joe pie weed occurs in partially shaded, moist woodlands, in wet meadows, and in thickets. It is an erect perennial which typically grows four to seven feet tall and forms colonies. It has three to five coarsely serrated, lance shaped dark green leaves, up to 12 inches long, that are arranged in whorls around the stem. It also has purplish leaf nodes. 
Its flowers are teeny vanilla scented and are colored dull pinkish purple and form in large open compound inflorescences. They bloom midsummer to early fall. Seed collection typically occurs mid to late September or early October. Other Eutrotrium species closely resemble the Eutrotrium purpureum, but can be differentiated by their habitat preference. Sweet Joe pie weed grows in shadier habitats, where, whereas spotted Joe pie weed prefers full sun. Hollow stem Joe pie also prefers full sun and has a more cylindrically shaped inflorescence and a hollow stem. Coreopsis tripteris, or tall Coreopsis, typically occurs in prairies, dry open woods, and woodland margins. It typically grows three to eight feet tall and it flowers from mid to late summer and into the fall. Tall Coreopsis features solitary yellow daisy-like flowers that are one to two inches in diameter and have eight yellow rays and distinguishing maroon to brown center discs. Below the flower are thin linear-like floral bracts. Its leaves also help to easily distinguish it from other Coreopsis species. These are divided into three to five narrow leaflets that are arranged in, in pairs opposite of each other along the stem. Again, you'll want to collect the entire seed head and place it in your bag to dry. In comparison to other Coreopsis species, tall Coreopsis has a greater height and a dark center disc, which makes it readily distinguishable from other Coreopsis species, most of which have yellow centers. Because of its height, tall Coreopsis may be confused with some of the sunflowers. However, sunflowers have simple leaves in comparison to tall Coreopsis's odd pinnate leaves. Also, Halianthus species, or sunflowers, have overlapping layered floral bracts in comparison to the tall Coreopsis, which has a single layer. The next two plants we'll be discussing are the iron weeds. Vernonia fasciculata, or smooth ironweed, can be found in the full sun habitat areas, including both wet and mesic prairies and in meadows. Smooth ironweed grows to be a stout, unbranched, two to four foot tall plant. The central stem is often reddish to purple and hairless, which is a key to distinguishing it from other ironweeds. Its leaves are alternate, narrow lanceolate to linear. They have serrated margins. The lower leaf surface may be pitted or appear to have black dots. Its floral arrangement is also a key to identification. It forms a tight, flat-topped cluster made up, of, made up from 15 to 30 violet-purple florets, approximately one and a half to four inches wide. Seed collection is approximately late September to mid-October, it's easiest to cut off the entire flower head and remove the chaff and fluff from the seed in an area where you're sheltered from the wind. The seeds should be dark in color and plump. If, if the seeds are flat, this indicates they're not mature yet. Giant ironweed is one of the tallest ironweeds growing up to eight feet tall in one season. It typically occurs in moist woodlands and in prairies and meadows. This perennial has a single stiff leafy stem, which branches just under the inflorescence. The stem is lightly pubescent with small hairs. This is a key to identifying this plant in particular. Its leaves are alternate and narrowly ovate to elliptic. The arrangement of its flowers are another key to identifying it. In contrast with smooth ironweed, giant ironweed's flowers are arranged in an open flat-headed panicle spanning from 6 to 16 inches across. Its flowers will give way to rusty seeds in clusters. Seed collection typically occurs around early October with the same protocol as other as the smooth ironweed. Euthamia graminifolia, a grass leaf goldenrod, can be found in moist to drier thickets and in open areas. It grows one to four feet tall and has branch stems. It has narrow, 
long grass-like leaves. The larger leaves have three prominent veins and sometimes two additional obscure veins. Its flowers form in flat open clusters of yellow. The flat top floral arrangement and narrow leaves of this goldenrod easily distinguish it from other goldenrods. Collection time typically takes place in mid-October. It's easiest to cut off the entire flower head and remove the chaff and fluff from the seed in an area where you're sheltered from the wind. Circium discolor is, or field thistle can be found in moist to dry prairies, in openings in woodland areas and other moist open areas. It is a biennial or short-lived perennial that grows two to eight feet tall. The stems have white hairs, but do not have spines. The leaves are alternate and pinnately lobed and have pronounced spiny uh, protrusions. The leaves measure up to nine, inch, nine inches long and three inches across. They're green on the upper surface, but, but powdery white on the lower surface from its minute hairs. Several to many flower heads branch off the main stem in the upper part of the plant. These flower heads are about two inches across and they're light pink to lavender in color. They consist of numerous disc florets. A key distinguishing characteristic are the overlapping floral bracts at the base of each flower head. The bracts are flat and green with a white stripe and somewhat resemble fish scales. The bloom period is from late summer into fall and lasts about a month for individual plants. Again, it's easiest to cut off the fl entire flower head and remove the chaff and fluff from the seed in an area where you're sheltered from the wind. Tall thistle, or Cercium altissimum, closely resembles field thistle with similar lurking flowers, floral bracts, hairy stems without spines, and has white on the underside of the leaves. The most notable difference is found in the upper leaves, which are broadly elliptic and not lobed like the field thistle. Field thistle can be distinguished from non-native from non bull thistle by the undersides of its leaves, which are green. Non-native thistles are also easily distinguished by their sharp spines, especially along the stem. Field thistle is also not as aggressive as bull thistle, so will be found in smaller numbers. And now we'll be discussing our fall blooming species, beginning with Oligonon rigidum, or stiff goldenrod. Stiff goldenrod's habitat is in, far, in full to partial sun, in dry to moderate moisture prairies, and in woodland edges. Stiff goldenrod, goldenrod will grow to be two to five feet tall. Its leaves are alternate, stiff gray to green, oval to oblong, and hairy on both sides. The lower leaves are up to 10 inches long and five inches wide along long petioles. These become progressively smaller towards the top of the plant, which are found on short petioles or stalkless. The stem is unbranching on the lower stem and it's densely hairy. This species will bloom from August through October. Its yellow flower heads are approximately half inch wide with seven to 14 petal-like ray flowers surrounding a central disc. The flowers are arranged in flat to rounded clusters at the top of the plant. The branch below the flower cluster has many small leaf-like leaf -like bracts. Seed collection is mid to late October and because of its dispersal mechanism, it is easiest to remove the entire flower head and separate the fluff when you're home, sheltered from the wind. Symphiotrichum levi, or smooth aster, typically occurs in prairies, rocky glades, and dry open woods. This perennial plant is one and a half to three feet tall. It branches on the upper parts of the plant. Alternate leaves occur along the entire length of these stems. They are oblong to ovate and become gradually smaller in size towards the top of the plant. Both the lower and upper leaves clasp their stems. Small flowers with violet blue to purple, and sometimes white, rays surround a yellow center. 
These appear in loose, open, panicle-like clusters in the fall. Seed collection typically occurs around early November. And the last plant we'll be discussing today is Symphiotrichum novangeli, commonly known as New England Aster. This is a native perennial which occurs in moist prairies, meadows, and thickets. It is a stout leafy plant, typically growing three to six feet tall with a robust upright habit. It features a profuse bloom of daisy-like flowers up to one and a half inches in diameter. The flowers have purple rays and yellow centers that bloom from late summer to early fall. Its rough, hairy, lance-shaped leaves are up to four inches long and clasp the stiff, hairy stems. Seed collection typically occurs in early November. Before we part, for those of you who are interested in participating in our habitat survey and in making long-term commitments to incorporating pollinator best management practices on your land, we invite you to enter our preliminary online survey, which you can find on the Project Wingspan homepage. Thank you so much for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you out in the field.